It's a great pleasure and uh, privilege uh, for me to introduce Professor, uh, our speaker, Professor Tirumalat Krishna, uh, who's PhD, FRCP, FRC Path. Uh, he's the chair of Allergy, Clinical Immunology and Global Health, Institute of Immunology and Immunotherapy, University of Birmingham, which is a World Allergy Organization Center of Excellence. He is an honorary consultant allergist and an immunologist at University Hospital Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust. And um, he's also the head of postgraduate school of pathology, West Midlands Health Education England. And he also serves as an uh, adjunct professor in the Department of Pulmonary Medicine, CMC Velo. Um, he has, uh, he, he was the lead author of many guidelines, including some uh, BSACI, that is uh, British Society for Allergy and Clinical Immunology guidelines on various uh, allergic conditions and co-author for many other guidelines um, like uh, NICE. Um, so he was, um, he served as a member of uh, NICE Drug Allergy Clinical Guidelines Development Group as well. Uh, so he has also represented as a clinical expert in various other uh, guideline development committees, RCP um, uh, uh, also. And uh, he has authored many uh, book chapters in prestigious international textbooks in the field of allergy and immunology and, more, and has more than 100 publications in highly cited journals uh, in allergy and immunology. So today he's going to talk about practical approach to penicillin allergy investigation and management, which I think is a very timely topic uh, in the context of an uh, increased incidence of fatal anaphylactic reactions, um, which happened over the past, past few weeks in our country. Uh, so um, you can send in your questions to the chat box. Uh, so at the end of the, uh, the lecture, we will discuss your questions. Um, now, can I um, uh, uh, invite Professor TK to deliver his lecture? Over to you, Professor TK. Thank you very much indeed uh, for the very kind uh, introduction. It's an absolute uh, pleasure and honor to be here and to share some of my experiences regarding drug allergy uh, with you. And I would like to thank uh, you and the organizers for giving me an opportunity to do this presentation today. This is going to be uh, on the back of the uh, presentation I did last week uh, regarding introduction to drug allergy. So I appreciate that some of the audience might not have made it to the last meeting. So there might be some repetition with certain slides, which I think is essential to make this presentation uh, more meaningful and helpful to, to, to everyone. So uh, I'll make a start now. So the title of my presentation is A Practical Approach to Pensionology. I added the second bit on the, on, the, on the title, which is a high income country specialist viewpoint. And the reason I did that deliberately was because I think that, uh, you know, the, the viewpoint in other countries, uh, particularly in the Indian subcontinent might be slightly different for various reasons including antibiotic prescription patterns and uh, local governance framework and many other factors. So therefore, uh, and also it is fair to say that uh, most of the evidence that I'm going to present today is coming from uh, the Western countries. And therefore, it is a, I think it's entirely appropriate to say it's a high income country specialist viewpoint, but we can, we can have that discussion at the end of the presentation. So uh, if I may say, I'll start with uh, the burden of pensionality labels and its adverse impact um, in high income country healthcare settings, uh, just to set the scene. And then we'll dive straightly into the clinical assessment of a patient uh, who declares a pensionality label, which is unverified. And what is the importance of risk stratification of patients in the context of delabeling? And what is our current approach to pencil allergy delabeling in high income countries in terms of investigations? And what are the uh, facilitators and barriers uh, to this process? 
And then um, I think, uh, you know, you're all interested in knowing about the cross-reactivity between penicillins and cephalosporins and carbapenems, which I think is entirely, uh, an, uh, uh, you know, appropriate to this presentation. So that's going to be the content of my presentation. So uh, some of you may be uh, familiar with the slide. Uh, the World Health Organization, uh, you know, published this uh, AWARE classification. AWARE is an acronym that stands for Access, Watch, and Reserve Group of Antibiotics. And this is a kind of strategy to enable standardization of antimicrobial stewardship, if you like. And what that would do is to just remind us that, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the prescription is uh, first uh, towards the access group of antibiotics, which are penicillins, the first generation cephalosporins and septrin. And then as a second line, we use second to fourth generation cephalosporins, quinolones and macrolides. And reserve, as the name suggests, is the last course of action that's carbapenems, daptomycin, and fifth generation cephalosporins. This is a strategy that the WHO has, uh, has proposed as, uh, uh, you know, um, to, towards a campaign against global antimicrobial resistance. And as you can see there on the slide, um, you know, if no action is taken for antimicrobial stewardship towards AMR, we are going to have about 2.4 million people uh, who might die due to MRSA superbug infections over the next 30 years. And at present, there are the, the, the incidence of uh, antimicrobial resistance is alarming in low middle income countries. It's anything between 40 to 60%. It might be even higher in India, I believe, in some parts, 60 to 80%. So therefore, it's really important for all prescribers, all people treating infection, regardless of whether you're in primary care or secondary care, to be aware of the AWARE classification. Now, why is AWARE important? Because, uh, you know, the next couple of slides will make that, uh, uh, make that clearer. So over the last 20 years or so, there's been a global increase in antimicrobial uh, prescription. Okay, and you can see there that, uh, you know, between 2000 and 2015, there's a huge spike uh, in the prescription patterns seen in India, China, and other low middle income countries. And, and, and you know, high income countries, uh, you know, have shown a similar trend, particularly if you look at carbapenem usage. It has, uh, it has gradually increased over the last 20, uh, you know, between 2000 and, and to 2015. So, 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 so if you look at the uh, English surveillance program for antimicrobial utilization resistance, what we call as SPAR, there's been a 17% increase in bloodstream infections um, in the recent years, with a 33% increase in antimicrobial resistance uh, in patients with bloodstream infections. So the WHO has uh, put together what is called as a global action plan towards antimicrobial resistance. And objective four is about optimization of use of antibiotics, both in humans and, and in animals. So in the UK, the government has set some targets, and that is to reduce uh, the antibiotic usage in the primary care by about 25%, using 2013 as a baseline and at least 10% in the reduction in the use of reserve and watch group of antibiotics using 2017 as baseline. Now, so, so this topic becomes very relevant because if you look at the burden of pencil allergy, 6% of the England population and 10% of the USA population carry pencil allergy labels, okay? And if you take a hospitals in high income countries at any given time, 15 to 20% of inpatients declare a pencil allergy label. And this is really relevant because 90 to 95% of these pencil allergy labels are inaccurate. And that you see on the right-hand side on the slide where you have a systematic review of various studies that uh, systematically investigated patients who, are, who declare a pencil allergy label. And what we have seen is that on an average, about 95% of these patients who declare an allergy to penicillin had negative skin tests, okay? So that's the huge burden of penicillin allergy label in, in high income countries. And therefore, you know, to use aware classification, uh, to implement aware classification, the penicillin allergy delabeling becomes really key, at least in high income countries, because if you were to promote the 
prescription of penicillins as first line antibiotics, surely you have to delabel patients who got inaccurate or spurious penicillin allergy labels. So that is the context of and the importance of aware classification in the context of uh, penicillin allergy delabeling. Now, what are the consequences of penicillin allergy delabeling? Now, this is uh, uh, a very nice study published by uh, uh, Dr. Blumenthal from Harvard. What she did was she very smartly used the primary care data, database that we have in the UK and looked at the risk of uh, MRSA and Clostridium difficile infection in patients with and without penicillin allergy label and showed that the patients who carried a penicillin allergy label had an enhanced risk of MRSA and C. diff. That means that if you had a penicillin allergy label, you're more likely to, to develop MRSA and C. diff infection. And that's because you get prescribed alternative antibiotics, which enhance that risk. Now, this is a study that we did at my hospital uh, a few years ago. Uh, this is my registrar, Dr. Birmingham, who has now become a consultant. And we looked at uh, uh, patients with and without penicillin allergy labels and what impact that might have on the management of sepsis. So uh, rather than going into the details, the point I want to make here is that if you had a penicillin allergy label, you are less likely to receive the first dose of antibiotic within an hour after the diagnosis of sepsis, which is really critical to a good clinical outcome. And what you can see on the left-hand side of the slide is that ha having a penicillin allergy label in the context of sepsis leads to a very high rate of prescription of carbapenem, spinelones, and aminoglycosides. And then if you express that data as DDD, um, as per the WHO classification, you can see that it significantly enhances the costs of antibiotic therapy, and indeed might also lead to a longer hospital stay because patients would need IV antibiotics. This is another study by Dr. Blumenthal from Harvard, who has shown that if you had a penicillin allergy label, you're more likely to receive alternative antibiotics such as clindamycin, vancomycin, and gentamicin. And this is in the post, uh, you know, in, in the post-surgical context where there's a a very high risk of developing surgical site infections in those with penicillin allergy labels. So you can see the downstream consequences of these spurious penicillin allergy labels on antimicrobial stewardship. So let's now turn our attention to the adverse reactions to penicillin. What are the different types? Very broadly speaking, you can classify adverse reactions as uh, those that are mediated by immuno immune system, which is immunological, and those which are non-immunological. Okay, so our interest today is on the immunological uh, manifestations of adverse reactions. And we can classify them as per well, gel and Coombs, which is type 1 to type 4 hypersensitivity. I'm not going to go into the details of each one of them. Uh, but what is important to know is type 1 hypersensitivity is, is, uh, is an immediate hypersensitivity reaction that is mediated by IgE, which is an allergy antibody produced by the immune system. And what that leads to is immediate reactions, usually manifesting as urticaria, angioedema, and in severe cases, anaphylaxis. And type 4 hypersensitivity or delayed or non-immediate hypersensitivity reactions are T-cell mediated. And fortunately, like I mentioned last week, most reactions are rather benign and manifest as a measles rash or an exanthematous drug eruption. But you do have more nasty systemic uh, hypersensitivity reactions that we discussed last week, like Steven Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis, which uh, certainly brings patients into hospital and there's a high risk of mortality if the drug is not stopped immediately and the reaction not treated. So what is the relevance of type one and type four reactions? Because these two types of reactions are most common with respect to penicillin and they are amenable to, to, to skin testing. Okay, so using skin testing, we are able to diagnose type 1 and type 4 hypersensitive reactions. On the other hand, type 2 and type 3 are rather rare, and skin testing must not be used for these reactions, not only because they are useless, but also because it can potentially lead to a recurrence of the reaction uh, by exposure of the patient to even a tiny amount of the allergen. So in order to understand the investigations of uh, penicillin allergy, it is important to have some basic knowledge regarding the structure, okay? 
So penicillins come under the beta-lactam group, and that's because they share a beta-lactam ring, as you can see on the slide. It is right in the center, beta-lactam ring. And you see the beta-lactam ring in penicillins, in cephalosporins, in carbonyms, and in the monobactam astronym. Okay. So what happens is this beta-lactam is adjacent to another ring, which is, for example, in penicillins, it's the thiazolidin ring. And in cephalosporins, it's dihydrothiazin. So the side ring is not that important. It's the beta-lactam ring and the R1 that you see, the side chain, that are really important to understand penicillin and its cross-reactivity. So what happens is that when you take penicillin, the beta-lactam ring opens up. And it, in, and, it, in, and it binds to some endogenous proteins, uh, leading to what's called as haptonization. And the allergy antibody is then directed to these haptons, okay? So what happens is that you, that leads to the formation of its metabolites, which are penicillin major and minor determinants. And the Ig antibody can be directed to the major and minor determinants. But over the last 20 to 30 years, what we have seen is as the prescription pattern changed to amino penicillins, we are seeing more and more of what is called as uh, the side chain reactivity. That means the IgE antibody is principally directed to the R1 side chain. Okay, so 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 there are two types of uh, IgE antibodies you, that you can see in the context of penicillin allergy. One is that directed to the uh, uh, major and minor determinants, as I said to you, that is coming from the beta lactam ring and it's binding to the endogenous proteins. And then you have the side chain reactivity, which is the R1 side chain. So the whole concept of the side chain uh, of cross reactivity comes between the similarity of the R1 side chains that penicillin might change, with, uh, might share with cephalosporins or with carbapenems. Okay, so the more the uh, structural similarity, the greater is the risk of cross reactivity. Okay, I will go through this in a bit more detail, but I just thought I'll set the scene with these concepts. So the most important thing in penicillin allergy is history. If you do not take a good history, you're going to get it wrong. Okay, so it's really important to invest the time talking to your patient, asking them, when did this reaction happen? Was it after the first dose? If it's after the first dose, it is going to be immediate hypersensitivity reaction. If it's going to be during a course of therapy, that is more suggestive of a non-immediate hypersensitivity reaction. What was the route of administration? How long did it take after administration of the antibiotic uh, for the reactions to manifest? And what were the symptoms? Was it just a rash? Was there angioedema? Was there cardiorespiratory compromise? And in non-immediate reactions, you really want to know whether the patient was systematically unwell. Was there mucosal involvement? Was there cardiac involvement? Was there respiratory involvement? Was there acute renal failure? So all these things would help you put together the the, the, the picture of the very complex jigsaw to then come to a conclusion at the end of the history, is this immediate or is this non-immediate hypersensitive reaction? The other very important thing is to know whether the patient was on any other medications that might have caused the reaction. You don't want to miss an NSAID induced reaction. Or you also want to know what type of infection, for example, if the patient had a glandular fever, for example, particularly in the context of children, they had, uh, then they are more likely to have a non-allergic uh, cutaneous reaction in the context of amoxicillin and glandular fever. So these little clues are really important in order to arrive at a good clinical diagnosis. Equally, uh, we, uh, we are very keen to review the patient's hospital records. We are keen to review the GP records because in 20 to 30% of patients, what we have seen is that they carry a label, but someone has actually prescribed Augmentin or Comoxiclav, and the patient's actually tolerated it even without knowing that it's a penicillin. So these little, uh, you know, tricks uh, would help you, uh, you know, arrive at an accurate uh, clinical diagnosis. And once you've done that, then you think about conducting allergy tests. And this is usually done by an expert who is trained and uh, we do skin testing, we do, uh, we send a blood sample for in vitro testing. I have to say that the in vitro tests don't really perform very well and some centers don't even bother to request for in vitro tests, which is actually looking at a circulating specific IgE to penicillins. Uh, and I don't really request it in the recent years because I know that the performance hasn't been very good. So I rely more on 
skin tests. Now, or if you look at various studies, the skin test performance is not great, actually. Uh, it's anything up to 70% negative predictive value. That means that about 20 to 30 patients, percent of patients who had a good going clinical history, the skin test may not pick up the, the uh, diagnosis. So that means that what you need to do in those patients is if you want to be absolutely sure whether or not they are clinically reactive or uh, you know they are clinically tolerant, you need to go to the next step, which is drug provocative testing. We'll talk about that in a moment. So you need, need to be really careful in uh, patient selection for drug provocative testing. The whole idea of drug provocative testing or challenge testing is to prove that someone is not allergic. What we don't want to do is to uh, be a bit careless and uh, you know induce anaphylactic reactions in the clinic. We don't want to do that. So if you carefully take a history and go and scrutinize, and scrutinize clinical records, you're more likely to stratify patients well in terms of low risk and high risk. And if you select the right kind of patients, uh, you know, almost 100% of the time, you are able to show that the patient is clinically tolerant. So really, that is that's key to to patient selection process. So what are the prerequisites? Anyone who is undertaking pensionology test should have the basic knowledge and experience, so they ought to be trained. You need to conduct these investigations in a safe clinical environment in secondary care, not in primary care, where you have immediate access to the management of anaphylaxis and critical care in case that your patient becomes very poorly despite all the care that you take. It's very important that you counsel your patient regarding skin testing, their performance, the potential risk of allergic reactions. You get a written informed consent document in the notes. And then you also need a patient who can cooperate with you through the entire process. And I'll tell you why. So we've done this. I'm going to... So it's also important that you ask your patient to discontinue antihistamines or drugs with antihistamine properties, such as amitriptyline, for at least three days before the test. As far as possible, we ask the patient to stop a beta blocker uh, for about three or four days, depending on the half-life, because that can potentially interfere with the management of anaphylaxis. And that might require some liaison with the patient's primary care physician or cardiologist just to know why the patient is on beta blocker so you don't endanger the patient from a cardiac site. Also, if the patient has got asthma or COPD, you want to make sure that their treatment is optimized and their lung function is uh, stable and well controlled before you conduct these investigations. So this is all enhancing the safety aspects of the, of the pro process. So like I said last time, the skin prick tests involve putting drops of different solutions of interest on the skin. You need to include a positive control. You need to include a negative control in order to validate the test. So what you do is you gently prick the top layer of the uh, skin, the epidermis, and then you mop off the solutions uh, with a paper towel. And then you wait for about 15, 20 minutes to record for a wheel and flare response. And anything that is three millimeter or greater than the negative control is considered to be a positive skin prick test. Now, if the skin prick tests are negative, then we go into the, uh, to the next stage which is an intradermal test, which I'm sure you're all familiar with in the context of MAN2 test. But what we do here is we inject a tiny drop, 0 0.03 to 0 0.05 mils into the, derm into the uh, um, uh, dermis. And then we uh, look for 15 to 20 minutes. We wait for a wheel and flare response again. And then this gives an opportunity for us to monitor that site for about 72 hours to look, at, to look for any delayed reaction. So what you see on the right-hand side there is a patient with a delayed hypersensitivity reaction to augmentin. And what you get is a five millimeter or more area of erythema, which is indurated. And sometimes you can see small recycles. And what that shows is a very strongly positive delayed hypersensitivity reaction. So in the context of penicillin, the IACI, the European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology have, pro have provided non-irritant concentrations. You can get commercial kits actually, dieter, is a kit that we use in UK and most European countries. And that gives us some ready-made uh, uh, concentrations of uh, the penicillin major and minor determinants. Then we also add the benzyl penicillin, amoxicillin, and any other semi-synthetic penicillin that is of interest uh, for the patient. And also 
you know, you might want to include some cephalosporins or carbapenems, depending upon the clinical situation. And uh, like I showed you last week, there are published non-irritant concentrations for all these drugs so that you can standardize the process. So really, when a patient comes, you have to include the whole panel for skin testing. So it is time consuming. Okay, and then what you do is you, you have to draw a map of where the different drugs have gone on the skin. Uh, and then you ask the patient to monitor that area uh, for, for 72 hours, ask them not to scratch that area so you don't get any spurious results. And at the end of 72 hours, if they report back to say that there's nothing to see, then that is negative. On the other hand, if there's something to see, you bring them back to the clinic or you can ask them to take a photograph with a tape measure adjacent so you can have a, an idea about the, uh, the appearance and the size of the erythema in duration. So that's the whole process of skin tests. So as you can see, it does need specialist input. It takes time, it needs resources, and it takes about two to three days before you can get a full uh, you know, result about immediate and non-immediate -hy hypersensitivity reaction. So this is a, a flow diagram, uh, which essentially summarizes uh, what I have just been talking about. I can go through it again with you. So you take a history, you do a prick test with the entire panel. If the prick test is negative, then you go into the intradermal test with the same panel, okay? If the intradermal test is positive at 20 minutes, then that is confirmatory of an immediate or type one hypersensitivity reaction. If it is negative, then you monitor that site for 72 hours to look for the uh, erythema that is indurated. And at 72 hours, if there's no evidence of any reaction, then the skin test can be considered negative for immediate and non-immediate hypersensitivity. And then you subject the patient for a, a challenge test, okay? So this is the same uh, thing, uh, looking for non-immediate hypersensitivity reaction. So once your skin test has been negative, both for immediate and non-immediate hypersensitivity reaction, then you go to the drug provocative test, okay? Now, the, the actual protocol for a drug provocation test has not been validated or standardized. So it all depends upon you know, your local protocols, what your local preference is. Now, we do different, uh, uh, follow different uh, protocols in our center. Sometimes we choose to give a single dose of 500 milligrams and observe the patient for an hour. And in those who have got significant COPD or asthma, we might uh, actually choose to do a three-step protocol so you don't give the full dose at, the, at once and then um, observe the patient for 30 minutes between different doses, um, check their vitals, and then observe the patient for an hour after the final dose, okay? So that way you've excluded type one hypersensitivity reaction. Then the question of delayed hypersensitivity comes. So what we do in Birmingham, in my center, is then we give the patient a prescription for amoxicillin 250 milligram twice daily for three days or five days. And the patient rings us at the end of five days to say whether or not they tolerate it. And of course, during those three days, if they do develop any reaction. We educate them what to do and they report to us as soon as possible. And that way we are able to, uh, you know, confirm whether or not the patient is clinically tolerant or if they have reacted. And if so, what is the characteristic of that reaction, whether it's type one or type four hypersensitivity. So you can see that uh, there are some challenges with pencil allergy tests. Given the huge burden, like I said, 6% of the population, 15 to 20% of inpatients, there's no way we can go around the hospital every day and undertake testing for all patients. And there's a desperate shortage of allergy specialists, not just in the UK, globally. So it is, it is, it is simply impossible for us to uh, offer this test routinely. So at present, you know, we get referrals of, or on an emergency basis, someone has got bacterial endocarditis or if they got syphilis in pregnancy or neurosyphilis, then that's treated as urgent. Otherwise, you know, the priority for skin tests is mainly for patients with infection related comorbidities like those with bronchiectasis, those with primary or secondary immune deficiency, those who are undergoing chemotherapy, uh, and so on and so forth, diabetes. Uh, so if those comorbidities are not present, they usually don't qualify for pencil allergy testing. And you can see that uh, there's considerable resource and cost involved, and there's a potential risk for allergic reactions 
in those who, who are in the high risk category. So what we proposed a few years ago was, you know, can we modify this protocol somewhat so that we can sort of circumvent the need for skin tests and can we actually identify patients who can be subjected to a challenge procedure directly by a non-specialist, okay? So that means that from the history and after scrutiny of clinical records, are you then able to classify patients as low risk and high risk? Low risk patients are those who are least likely or very highly unlike, very unlikely to develop a hypersensitivity reaction. That means they are declaring non-specific symptoms which really don't sound immune mediated and they don't have any significant comorbidities in terms of cardiac or respiratory. So if we can identify those patients through a structured history, then a non-specialist colleague, say in internal medicine or in gastro or something, can undertake a direct challenge under their own care. So the patient doesn't need to enter the referral pathway. On the other hand, if you had a patient who gave a history of uh, you know, hypersensitivity or something in the history that is suggestive of hypersensitivity or they have severe COPD or asthma and so on, then they fall into the high risk category and they would then have to go through the whole gamut of testing, skin testing and challenge test under specialist care. Okay, so there are different classifications that have come out from the UK, from the US, from Australia, about what is low risk and what is high risk. So let me just go through some of it. So what are the danger signs in beta-lactam? So if someone tells you that their hands and feet started itching, they developed urticaria, they couldn't breathe, of course, it is uh, suggestive of an immediate hypersensitivity reaction. Similarly, if someone gives you a history of severe skin involvement with mucosal involvement, uh, you know, skin peeling off, that is very suggestive of SJS and toxic epidermal necrolysis. Or if they had fever, they had lymphadenopathy, they had abnormal liver function tests or renal function, that is suggestive of a, of a systemic hypersensitivity reaction. Okay. On the other hand, if you had patients who are just saying, oh, we had slight itching, no rash, or a very small area of rash, or isolated GI involvement, or feeling slightly dizzy, no other symptoms, then they are low risk patients. So if you had, or, or sometimes a patient can say, oh, my mom and dad have pencil allergy. I've never taken penicillin for that reason. So that's not pencil allergy. It doesn't run, you know, it doesn't run in families. We know that. So, so just a family history on its own uh, is a low risk. So there are, so this is the ways in which one can, you know, stratify patients as low risk, high risk, and then, you know, smartly use the skin tests and that way you're able to access more patients, you're able to delabel more patients, and then you're able to implement the AWARE guidelines that I talked about, thereby pres prescribing penicillin safely and delabeling patients successfully. Okay, so this is uh, the, the British classification. I'm not going into the details uh, uh, because it will take a lot of time, but essentially, I think I've given you the gist. There are slight differences between the, um, uh, between the American, the Australian, and the uh, British uh, risk stratification process, but essentially they are underpinned by a good history and scrutiny of medical records and the nature of symptoms that I've just uh, talked about. So in order to implement this risk stratification, in order to get our colleagues in acute medicine or uh, anesthesia or other non-allergy specialties on board, I think, you know, we need to, uh, we need to have we need to work as a multi-disciplinary uh, uh, team, okay? So which means that uh, we need to enhance uh, the knowledge and skill. We need to have clear referral pathways. We need to have clear lines of responsibility and we need to have good leadership, okay? Now, the whole problem here is there's no point of care test for penicillin, okay? So, so really, you know, once you're able to uh, do that, and can we also get the risk stratification process on, on a handheld electronic device? Okay, so what we did a few years ago is we developed a computerized decision support system, uh, like an app that can be put on a mobile phone or a, any other portable device, which will ask the relevant questions. All you need to do is to say yes, no, yes, no. And then it gives you a risk stratification outcome as to whether your patient is low risk or high risk category. And then you're able to 
you know, take the patient through the direct oral penicillin challenge that I talked about without doing skin testing, or the patient enters the referral pathway and uh, through the allergy specialist, and they can have the skin testing and challenge process. Okay, but this requires a concerted effort. You need to have your senior management on board. You need to have a group of experts, uh, uh, preferably led by a specialist in allergy and clinical immunology. You need to have the hospital pharmacy on board. You need to have your microbiologists and infectious disease consultants on board. You need to have your senior nurses and you need to get this through your governance committee so that everything is clear in black and white. The lines of responsibilities are very clear. And I think it's really important for us to have uh, regular audits to uh, see how the uh, system is performing and whether there are any adverse reactions and that would need to be fully investigated. So here is an example uh, from the US where they implemented the CDSS uh, in, in their hospital. And they, what they found was there's a significant increase in the number of patients who are delabeled, a significant increase in the use of penicillins and cephalosporins. And I think this system has been up and running for a few years in Harvard, and they really haven't reported any significant uh, you know, cases of anaphylaxis or other hypersensitivity reactions. So it works quite well. And what they have is some online training for all the doctors in the hospital uh, to, to come on board with this, particularly junior doctors, so that, you know, over the years, more and more doctors are trained in this process of uh, labeling and delabeling. So now let us just move on to the cross-reactive debate. So just to remind ourselves, I talked about two things. I said that uh, when, you, when, when you take penicillin, the beta-lactam ring opens up, it binds to endogenous proteins, and you have the formation of penicillin major and minor determinants, which is, uh, and the Ig molecule can be directed to the major and minor determinants. And over the last 20, 30 years, we are seeing patients with cross, uh, with side chain reactivity. That means that their Ig is principally directed to the R1 side chain. So, because cephalosporins, carbapenems, and penicillins, they have R1 side chain, the level of similarity of the R1 side chain between penicillin, cephalosporins, and carbapenem is what determines the cross-reactivity. So this group very smartly conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis to ask the question, what is the level of cross-reactivity between penicillins, cephalosporins, and carbapenems? So this involved a systematic review of Medline and Embase databases uh, over 20 years, as you can see there. And the studies had to have certain criteria to be included in their analysis. At least 10 patients with a proven pencil allergy by skin test or by a challenge test had to be there. And those patients had to be assessed for cross-reactivity by undertaking skin tests with at least one cephalosporin or one carbapenem antibiotic. Okay, And then they modeled the data uh, of the antibiotics looking at side chain similarity using a bioinformatics approach. There were 21 observational studies included uh, with approximately 1,200 uh, patients or so. And this is a very interesting graph. So as you can see, uh, zero means there's no structural similarity at R1. And when it is dark red, that means they are identical. Okay, so there's a scoring system between zero to one. And what you see in the table is cephalosporins, first, second, and third generation, fourth generation. And on the horizontal axis, you have different penicillins, okay? So if you take, for example, let us take ampicillin there. So you can see that there is, it's dark red with cephalexin. That means they have identical uh, R1 side chain. And similarly, ampicillin shares an R1 side chain with cephalochlor. On the other hand, ampicillin, does not share, you know, share R1 side chain with, you can see the, uh, the third and the fourth generation cephalosporin. So that's how you read this graph. And again, the, the gradient of green also tells you the level of uh, no similarity. So it has to be dark red for, for, for you, uh, dark green for you to say that there's no structural similarity. And what you can see here is a graph which uh, gives you a risk uh, uh, of cross-reactivity. And what you can see is um, 
the if you had an identical uh, uh, R1 side chain, then um, you're more likely to, you're, there's about 16% uh, risk of uh, cross reactivity. And if it is intermediate uh, similarity in terms of R1 side chain, uh, it is about 6% or so uh, with cephalosporin. And if there is very minimal reactivity, it's about 2% or so. And that you can see in these graphs here in the meta-analysis. So in the first panel at the top, you can see when the, very, when the similarity score is very high, there's a 16% or so cross-reactivity between penicillins and cephalosporins. And when it is intermediate, it's about 5.6%. And when it is low, it is about 2% or so. And what is really important to understand is that this is very low indeed for carbapenems. So someone with penicillin allergy has got less than 1% chance of cross-reactivity with carbapenems. Okay, but what are the limitations of the systematic review? We don't want to just get carried away by these results. So these are all based on observational studies with relatively small sample size. So one needs to just remember that. There's also variability uh, in these studies in terms of their methodology. And only patients with amino penicillin allergy were uh, included in these studies. And most of these studies are coming from Europe. There are no in vitro techniques employed. And there is no distinction between cross-reactivity, cross-sensitization, and co-reactivity. What that means is that if someone had a positive skin test to cephalosporin, these studies presume that that was cross-reactivity. Sometimes you can get a false positive skin test. So due to ethical reasons, these patients were not challenged. So it was not possible in these studies to actually uh, say whether the patient is having cross-reactivity or simply cross-sensitization. Cross-sensitization means positive allergy test, but no clinical reactivity. But none of them went on to be challenged with the cephalosporin. And co-reactivity means that it's simply a chance observation that the patient is allergic to two different antibiotics independently, not because they are allergic to penicillin. So those kind of uh, things could not be addressed in these studies. But nevertheless, the data that has been generated is very valuable indeed. So there are other publications. Uh, you know, if you're going to devise protocols uh, at your center, there are a number of publications that gives you some nice tables that you can then adapt uh, to your own requirements, depending upon what cephalosporins are likely to be used in Sri Lanka, for example. So you can actually reduce the, uh, the, the, the population in this table by removing the cephalosporins that are not relevant for antimicrobial stewardship in Sri Lanka. That, by that way, you can actually make it less busier. Okay, so I just put these slides in to, to just uh, you know, make you aware that there are a number of resources um, in the medical literature that will help you devise your protocols for cephalosporins. And this is again a nice table from the IACI uh, guideline. Uh, sorry for the poor quality on the slide, but when you look at the actual publication, you can see how useful it might be if you laminate it in your office. And then you might be able to quickly look at uh, the, the, uh, the cross-reactivity risk when you're contacted for advice. Now, we all know that uh, you know, uh, you're in the clinic or you're, uh, you're doing something else and someone rings you about an urgent case and they want advice as to what should I do now with this patient. And you really don't have the time to go and see the patient as an allergy or immunology specialist and, but you need to give advice to your colleague in internal medicine who is struggling to manage a patient who needs to be treated promptly for an infection. So in that context, I think it's really important to know what can we do smartly and safely. So let's just go to the, the right-hand side of the slide. Okay, here are low-risk patients. Who, low-risk patients means that, you know, we've gone through that they are more, most unlikely to have uh, at an immediate reaction. So in those cases, you can confidently say, okay, use third, fourth, or fifth generation cephalosporins, uh, which have got different R1 side chain. Or you can give a full dose of carbapenems without worrying too much, okay? On the other hand, if you had a patient who after risk stratification is falling into the high risk category, that means they've had a history of anaphylaxis or they've had a a history of uh, a delayed systemic uh, hypersensitivity reaction or whatever grade that might be, uh, then what do you do? 
So in that case, again, what you do is you look at the infection, you look at the sensitivity, you ask the microbiologist what, what is their preferred route uh, of uh, travel. And then if they say, no, I want to use this or that Keplosporin, then you look at the, you look at your chart and you identify uh, a, a Keplosporin, preferably from the third, fourth or the fifth generation with a different R1 side chain. But here, what you do is you do a graded challenge. That means rather than giving the full dose of the Keplosporin, you might want to split it into three uh, divided incremental doses and observe the patient for half an hour or so between steps, okay? And you do the same thing with carbapenems also, give a graded challenge uh, under close observation of vital parameters and signs and symptoms, okay? So that's what you do for high-risk and low-risk patients when it comes to using keflosporins or carbapenems, okay? Now, even if you had a patient who is giving a history of al allergy to keflosporin, say, for example, then even in those cases, you look at a different keflosporin, different R1 side chain, and then use the same process, either give the full dose in low risk patients or a graded doses in, 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 in patients stratified as high risk. Now, what you don't see in this chart that we use in Birmingham is if you had a patient with a history of immediate hypersensitivity reaction, sometimes what we do is we just ask the patient to undergo, uh, we, we ask them to implement the uh, rapid drug desensitization. I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. So we have a protocol of pharmacists would go and, 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 and implement the process on the ward. Okay, so what is rapid drug desensitization? So it is a, an intervention, an immunological intervention that you would use in a patient who gives you a very clear history of type 1 hypersensitivity or anaphylaxis. It is not meant to be used for patients with delayed hypersensitivity. So what it does is, it is a method by which you start off with a really tiny dose, something like 10 to the power minus 6 of the dose, and every 15 to 20 minutes under close clinical observation, you, you up the dose until you reach the target dose. Okay, and this has to be done um, in... Um, in the context of bacterial endocarditis, in the context of neurosyphilis or syphilis in pregnancy. So those are the patients who would qualify for rapid penicillin desensitization. You can do it either orally or intravenously, depending upon uh, what the indication is. It has to be done. There, need, there has to be a protocol. It has to be under the direction of a specialist who knows what they're doing, but it can be implemented by uh, colleagues in internal medicine or intensive care or other medical specialties. It has to be done in an ICU or HDU setting with one-to-one -one observation. And here is a protocol for an oral desensitization process. As you can see, it takes about uh, four hours or so to complete the process. The, there are a number of protocols available. You can do it IV as well. Uh, the concept is really the same. If your patient reacts during the process, then you treat the reaction. Of course, you treat the reaction and once the reaction settles down, you can go back a couple of steps just to give the immune system a bit more time to adjust. And then you go back and do the desensitization process again, or you can add an intermediate step just to give that extra time for the immune system to adapt. And usually it's quite successful. And it's been used not just in the context of penicillin, but also in the context of biologics, in the cancer, in the context of cancer chemotherapy. And, and you know, it's, it's a really handy intervention to have to ensure that your patient gets the best care. But what is really important to remember is that the tolerance status is temporary. The tolerance will last only as long as the patient has a continued exposure to penicillin. So once, say the patient, for whatever reason, discontinues penicillin for a couple of days, the tolerance status is lost and you need to desensitize the patient all over again. This is really, really important to know. And you need to educate uh, your patient about that as well, because some of the patients might be taking the penicillin at home. So in summary, there's a huge burden of inaccurate penicillinality labels in high income countries, which is an impediment to the delivery of antimicrobial stewardship and it enhances the risk of antimicrobial resistance and quality of care. I hope you agree with me that acute labeling and delabeling is paramount in patient safety and tankly global antimicrobial resistance, which is a global public health problem. I hope you agree with me that a multidisciplinary approach, a concerted approach is really required 
and this would include upskilling healthcare professionals in the basic concepts of drug allergy, including history taking and documentation. Risk stratification is a very handy process, but it has to be done very carefully. And it's a very smart tool to circumvent the need for skin tests. And it can be adapted. It can be uh, done by a non-specialist, but with proper training. And you would also agree with me, I hope, that cognizance or awareness of cross-reactivity, which is quite simple between penicillin, cephalosporins, and carbapenems, is really critical in devising your local protocols. But what's really important is that as clinicians, we must not do any harm to our patients in the process of uh, trying to help. So I'll stop there, and I'm happy to take questions, and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Professor TK, for that very uh, interesting and very comprehensive lecture on penicillin allergy. Uh, so there is an audience of microbiologists here in the auditorium, so they can ask questions directly, and others can uh, send their questions to chat box. So I have a few questions in the chat box. Uh, so if the microbiologists uh, have any questions, they can ask directly. Uh, so I, um, so there are a few questions in the chat box. Uh, what are the common non-specific symptoms that are unlikely to be uh, true hypersensitivity reactions? Uh, yeah, thank, thank you for that. Uh, so the common ones that we see are patients presenting with diarrhea. And for, for I don't know for why, why those patients get labeled, any abdominal discomfort and diarrhea per se without any associated telltale symptoms of hypersensitivity reactions such as rash or swelling. The other very common thing we see is candidiasis is labeled as an allergy. And also we see patients who get slight dizziness, no other symptoms, or patients who've got a family history but have never taken penicillin is another uh, common reason. And also sometimes we have patients who've got a benign rash, very, very mild rash that occurs during the course of therapy, which is probably infection related. And mind you, most of these patients uh, are giving a history that occurred during childhood. And we all know that during childhood, uh, you know, viral induced rash is very common. So these are the common uh, manifestations that we see among Loris patients. Thank you. So there is another question that uh, uh, regarding uh, allergy to antibiotics uh, after multiple doses. So I also have a similar question because we had a fatal anaphylaxis uh, in a patient who had been... Uh, on keftazidim for four days, and on the eleventh dose, uh, after giving the eleventh dose, he had developed a fatal anaphylaxis um, with keftazidim. So it was given the same brand was given uh, uh, in the same manner, IV bolus. So what is the possibility of a type one reaction there, a true IgE mediated reaction? Yeah. So uh, first of all, very sorry to hear about the tragic uh, incident. Uh, you know, that, that actually, <laughs> one would argue that that goes against the principles of fundamental immunology, isn't it? That uh, someone has been on regular dose of the same drug, as you say, the same brand, uh, and uh, on the day 11 or something, they develop type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. That is very, very unusual indeed. Now, having said that, I have heard some anecdotes from colleagues uh, in Spain and other countries who have seen patients becoming sensitized during the course of therapy, okay? So that means that, uh, you know, um, they, 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 when they started off, they were not allergic, but for whatever reason, their allergic status has changed and they develop fatal anaphylaxis. That has to be very rare, isn't it? That goes completely against our understanding of uh, Jell and Coombs classification of type 1 and type 4 uh, hypersensitivity reaction, it goes completely against our understanding of immune tolerance. Uh, we just talked about desensitization. And I was just telling you that you stop the treatment for a couple of days and the patient can lose the tolerance status. Now, what I can share with you is an anecdote from my own practice where 
I've had somebody who, who uh, a few times actually, someone who, ha- who tolerated amoxicillin four to six weeks previously, their infection was not completely cleared and their uh, primary care physician gave them yet another course of uh, the amoxicillin and first dose anaphylaxis. So, but in that patient, at least there's been a gap, a time window of four weeks for the immune system to become sensitized and develop an IgE antibody. But what happened here in this case is very hard to explain, but I am hearing stories, fortunately, very, you know, it's only seldom, it's not a common occurrence. But, but then again, what you also need to do is you need to look through the patient's uh, records very carefully and see if there's any other allergen that might have been involved, both in terms of drug or food or anything else that might have potentially contributed. If that is not the case, then by default, you would, you would blame keftazidine. And did the patient have the, uh, the telltale manifestations of anaphylaxis, the tryptase and all that? Did you check all that? No, uh, unfortunately, because tryptase is not available uh, in our country, in the government sector. So we can't do tryptase in any of, but uh, the features were typically, they are of type one reaction. The patient had uh, difficulty in breathing and uh, he had uh, angioedema, uh, protruded um, swollen tongue, and uh, then cardiac arrest within minutes, within two minutes of administrating IV keftazidine. He was not on any other uh, drugs at the at, at time, actually, and not immediately before. Right. But unfortunately, we couldn't do a trip test. And also in uh, Professor TK, then in, in BSAC 2015 guidelines on uh, penicillin and allergy to penicillin, they, they, they mention that uh, the IgE, the accelerated or immediate reactions due to IgE uh, can occur uh, during the course of treatment within the first four days. Uh, so we, when we referred the guideline, it says that uh, IgE re- uh, reactions can occur up to the fourth day into the drug course, uh, but immediately after the last dose. Yeah, so 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 that's uh, you know that, see you can see how the thinking has uh, changed over the last few decades, and I think I think you know I think it's important to put that into context. So I think I think you know for all the uh, you know here we are splitting hair, we are looking at small print, uh, we are looking at those rare patients, but I think it's really important to understand that a vast majority of patients who develop immediate hypersensitive reaction. The symptoms occur after the very first dose and usually within an hour or two after administration of an oral dose and pretty much straight away after a parental administration. So that is something that has to be in bold and, and, and very clear. Now, as I said, that we are hearing more and more, uh, you know, uh, anecdotes from colleagues about patients developing an immediate type hypersensitivity reaction during a course of therapy. That means that during day two, day three or something, they had their morning dose after having tolerated for three days and bang, they get anaphylaxis. Okay. That is not supposed to occur, but we are seeing that it, it is a very rare thing, including your patient with keftazidine, which you've described, which is rather 11 days is quite long actually. So, so I think, you know, that's why, that's why I would say, if you look at the algorithm for delayed hypersensitivity reactions, so when someone is te- giving you a history of delayed hypersensitivity reaction, you still exclude type 1 first, and then you look at the type 4 reaction. You never ignore the type 1 hypersensitivity. That means you do your prick test, you do an intradermal test, you exclude the wheel and flare at 15 to 20 minutes, and then you see what happens at 72 hours. So that's why I think that has been included in the algorithm. But it is important to repeat and reiterate that those things that you've just mentioned are relatively rare and common things are common. Yeah, thank you. So it was not the 11th day, it was the 11th dose on the day four. Day four. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so even that is very rare, as you said. And we had, actually, we explained another case last time uh, who uh, a patient, a very young patient, uh, who was on oral coamoxiclav for some time, and then when changed to IV, she developed an immediate reaction. I think 
we explained that to you last time also. And uh, any question uh, from the audience? And there is another uh, question in the chat. Um, how often do other allergies or atopic conditions coexist in a patient with penicillin allergy or antibiotic allergy? Do okay. we so, all... yeah. yeah, so thanks for that. So, uh, you know, I don't think there's any published data specifically answering that question, but what we do know is drug allergy occurs, a true drug allergy is independent of patient's atopic status. This is really important to know. Now, if you had, say, for example, you had allergic rhinitis, you're at a high risk of developing asthma. If you had eczema, you're at a high de risk of developing other allergic diseases, including food allergy. But drug allergy is not a part of that uh, allergic march. So drug allergy occurs uh, independently. Okay. Uh, so I, yeah, I have another question from the audience. Uh, before I am benzathine, penicillin, um, yeah, so if ST becomes positive before giving I am benzathine, penicillin, uh, what should we do? Uh, what What is the, uh, the, so those patients are on I am benzathine, penicillin regularly, uh, monthly, and if they become positive uh, with ST, Mm, what would you recommend? So, sorry, I didn't catch the question. Uh, we don't yeah, normally do skin testing for someone who is already on penicillin. Have we got? Have we misunderstood the question? No. Yeah, Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is regarding. Um, I think last time I told you that we have a practice where before giving antibiotics, sometimes they do various intradermal testing. So for our patients who are on regular IM penicillin, uh, they do what is called an intra, uh, ST with an intradermal dose. Now we frequently get referrals asking, now this becomes positive and then um, they want us to tell them whether to give the, they have never reacted, whether to give them the drug or uh, switch to erythromycin. So this is a frequent query. Um, so uh, if that is done in an acceptable intradermal concentration, um, the way we do, um, uh, then how do we set about uh, solving? Do they need an oral challenge with uh, a penicillin before giving the IM or can we just ignore and go ahead? So that's a, that's a very interesting question because uh, that's, uh, first of all, you know, with due respect, that's not the, uh, the standard practice of uh, doing skin tests while the patient is receiving penicillin. That's my first point. And therefore, I don't think there's any data to answer your question uh, directly. On the other hand, I would just try to extrapolate uh, other data as well as my own experience to try and answer that question. So what you're essentially saying is that this patient has also had a skin test before going on to penicillin. And during the course of penicillin therapy, they become sensitized as evidenced by a positive intradermal test. And then you're saying, what do I do now that the patient has become sensitized during the course of treatment. So the answer to that question is, anyone who is sensitized is at a higher risk of developing an allergic reaction compared to those who are not sensitized. So that's simple. The other thing is a positive skin test on its own doesn't equate to clinical reactivity. So whilst the risk of clinical reactivity is high in somebody, who has got a positive skin test, it doesn't mean that they all will develop anaphylaxis or will go on to react. But what is the percentage chance? That's very hard to say. I don't know. But what you would do in that situation is you would ask the question, do we still want to continue this practice of doing a skin test before starting a patient on penicillin and then monitoring the patient's sensitization status whilst they are on penicillin? That's the first question. Now, if you drop that protocol, then you are likely to have someone who just continues the full and, and completes the course of penicillin. On the other hand, if you feel that that's something that, you know, that's a local practice in Sri Lanka and this is what we want to do, then I would say I would do an oral challenge in that patient before giving them benzathin penicillin or something that's more depot preparation that is likely to last long in the body and also given parenterally. 
so we we you know even for example in 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 patients with uh, neurosyphilis or syphilis in pregnancy you know before they go on to have the benzat and penicillin after a desensitization process we actually give them the intramuscular penicillin or the oral amoxicillin first to assess clinical tolerance before they go on to the uh, benzat and penicillin so i think that's what i would do so if you're going to stick to the practice then it might be better to undertake an oral challenge first to make sure that the patient is okay before you carry on because it is possible i'll give you another analogy actually if you look at patients who are undergoing desensitization for wasp venom allergy or bee venom allergy okay so those patients have got a positive allergy test okay and 75% of patients with wasp venom allergy which has got 100% efficacy after undergoing full desensitization treatment and after showing clinical tolerance to a wasp sting also they continue to have a positive allergy test because what is the 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 sensitization the ig antibody in a patient who is clinically tolerant it just becomes a marker of sensitization so the sense the tolerance is mediated by t regulatory cells by regulatory t cells so that's a different pathway so rather than going into and sort of speculating more i think you need to take a pragmatic approach one of the following two routes one is either you you know you stop doing skin tests during the course of penicillin or if you want to continue that the moment you see a positive skin test undertake an oral challenge before you put the patient back on the benzathion penicillin that's what i would do in terms of a pragmatic approach and a safe approach okay thank you so this is another another question yes Anushka. Yeah, um, as you nicely explained um, about uh, major determinant, minor determinant, and side chain uh, cluster reactivity and so on. But is there any data regarding excipients in uh, antibiotics? Uh, I mean, uh, penicillins and um, maybe oral and gelatin or alpha gal or anything like that. Yeah, so I, I'm not aware of any. Uh... Uh, data regarding the excipients in the context of penicillin and it, since the covid pandemic there's a lot of attention towards the polyethylene glycol which i don't think has uh, fortunately featured in the context of penicillin allergy so i am not aware of any data regarding excipient allergy or indeed alpha gal in the context of penicillin allergy okay thank you so uh, just another quick question so would you recommend a uh... skin prick testing for cephalosporins and carbapenems in a patient with the penicillin allergy history routinely to okay. check the cross reactivity yeah so so it, it i mean in birmingham we don't do that routinely but there are other centers where it is done routinely so i think that's a very good question actually i would say that it's a good practice so what i would do is i would restrict the cross reactivity testing in patients who test positive for immediate or delayed hypersensitivity reaction so in in anticipation that they might go on to uh, have carbapenems or they go on to have cephalosporins you can look at the most likely cephalosporins they are they are going to get so what you can do is you can choose a cephalosporin of a different r1 side chain to the index one say for example it's amoxicillin or ampicillin or whatever then you pick the one from third to fifth generation which has got a different r1 side chain and pick one of the carbapenems uh, and actually show that it is negative for immediate and delayed hypersensitivity reaction the same sitting is literally another four tests that's all which will hardly take you a few minutes to do but by then what you're showing is one you have shown that this patient is allergic to penicillin and two you have said that okay if this patient requires cephalosporins or carbapenems in the future you can give x y or z okay so if the skin prick test is negative uh, you think it's uh, like uh, safe to give uh, uh, you know uh, non reactive uh, cephalosporin uh, or uh, well, um, abapenem who had a, a severe reaction in penicillin severe reaction before yeah so if so it depends so i would imagine that if you're going as far as showing a negative skin test then you would go on to do a challenge test for penicillin so then by doing a challenge test you're excluding penicillin allergy so then the reaction to uh, the cross reactive to carbapenem and cephalosporin is meaningless in that context because the cross reactivity matters only in someone who is truly allergic so i would do the skin test in those patients 
who are either positive on skin testing or who then react to the challenge test. I would not undertake cross activity testing for someone who is clinically tolerant to penicillin after testing. Okay, yes, understood. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? There aren't any from uh, the virtual participants as well. So in that case, I would like to thank uh, Professor TK uh, for mm -hmm. volunteering to uh, do a webinar series on drug allergy. Um, and thank you very much, Professor TK, for your time and contribution. Uh, and we will see you next week. Uh, uh, and we will have another lecture on uh, perioperative anaphylaxis. Thank you so much. We will conclude this session. Thank you. Thank you.